Okay, good morning. Um, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, this I'm just going to do a little bit of an introduction before I pass over to the house. So um, this session is part of the Guild program, and Guild is a sector support organisation partnership project run by E Street Arts. Its aim is to support the transformation of the artist-led sector uh, in terms of their growth and resilience. Uh, we support artist-led organisations by giving them resources and space to explore new approaches and advocating for them. This programme of workshops is called Guild Conversations, uh, which is running from this month right through till March. And it's a programme of workshops, talks, webinars, and facilitated conversations. Uh, and this program aims to equip the artist-led sector with some tools and resources and connect them with arts facilitators and artists from across the artist-led sector. Um, today's hosts are uh, Xavier and Carmen uh, from Marlborough Productions, uh, which I'm sure they'll uh, give you a little bit more information about. Um, so I'm just gonna hand it over to them. Okay, thank you so much everyone. Uh, thanks Matt for that intro. And um, it's always a pleasure to work with East Street Arts um, and in the Yorkshire region really. Um, so it was very nice to be here. Um, me and Carmen um, are from Marwood Productions, which um, is a Brighton led, um, a Brighton based uh, production company based at the Spire. And we focus mainly on the, uh, sorry, open this on the wrong page and <laughs> sorry about that um and uh yeah we'll go into more details about um the work that we do and the the how to create creating safer spaces um but beforehand we just want to give you a little bit of uh context but also some housekeeping um before we go into that so this will be around 45 minutes um we'll have then a break and a q a uh, please keep your questions to the end but you know feel free to put them in the chat in the meantime and maybe matt can collect them if any come in beforehand um so this workshop is uh, uh, uh produced by the two of us by me and carmen um and please engage with it and assume an intention of goodwill when participating in this workshop and we aim to create a safer space and we'll explain what this means um in the talk um if you want if anyone has any prescient and a very very urgent thing that they want to jump in or throw in uh just raise your hand or unmute yourself and and do um we want to make sure that everyone's voices are heard but before we go into the actual session, maybe Carmen can introduce yourself. Uh, hi, um, I'm Carmen De Cruz. I'm the general manager at Marlborough Productions. Sab, if you hit present and you can go to slide three and then you'll see a beautiful picture of me, the latest from my Instagram. Um, I've, <laughs> I've been uh, the general manager at Marlborough Productions for just over a year now, um, but my previous background was in corporate marketing. Um, and uh, public health. So I was the project manager for the NHS and um, the South East London Clinical Commissioning Groups, which is a consortium of um, about a quarter of London, where I was responsible for updating and maintaining all of the policies for the borough. So that was covering, um, you know, just all sorts of stuff from anti-terrorism policies and uh, what to do in case of a nuclear explosion, all the way through to um, children and safeguarding and code of conduct for your local GP practice. Um, so it was my job, part of my job to review. Very, very busy time, uh, which is why I now work in the arts, uh, which is a lot nicer. <laughs> um, can I just ask you a question? Can everybody see the screen share? So the... it's not showing up as, I can see your screen, but it's not showing up as um, presenting. Oh. Showing the title, like the, the tab. It's gone now. Yeah, there we go. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> that's uh, me. That's my new Instagram. Look, I got my hair cut. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, that's me. That's me in a nutshell. Cool. And okay, so that's me. And uh, I'm a culture worker and performance maker. I have been working with the Marble Productions 
for three years now and um, specifically to um, develop and <clears throat> present New Queers on the Block, which is a artist um, and touring development um, scheme or a program that happens across uh, England in five different locations. And um, I came into this as requested by uh, the Marlborough originally because they wanted me to lead on a touring project. And then we'll go more into that later, but the project kind of really shaped, changed directions after year one, um, specifically because of some of the work that we're gonna explore here today as well. Um, <clears throat> outside of outside of the Marlborough Productions, I work um, as a performance maker, I do my own work, but I also co-founded uh, the group Migrants in Culture, which is a, a research and activist group within the cultural sector advocating for migrant rights and uh, the abolition of the hostile environment. Um, so yeah, so that's the two of us. And we've been working together on New Quiz on the Block for a year now, I think, and we're preparing for next uh, for the next phase. We also have another representative of New Quiz on the Block in the room today, Lee Smith. Woohoo! Um, <laughs> pick it up. Um, so before uh, before we go into the um, actual workshop as well, I uh, just want to give you a little uh, agenda. So we do a little bit of an intro and then we'll go into the creating a safer space policy uh, with examples. We wanted to give you two main areas of focus. Um, first one will be on in venue and company and the other one will be on touring model. Uh, this is for the in venue. Uh, the, originally, when Matt invited us to do this, it was about um, uh, kind of focusing on how to turn spaces into safer spaces for LGBTQ plus people, specifically looking at the new quiz on the block model. But we thought we would expand it a little bit more because the new quiz on the block model was based on the model that already kind of existed within Marlboro Productions. So we thought that the two, because the two things kind of go hand in hand, but they also distinct and have different um, particularities. So we'll kind of, uh, hopefully we'll go into both of them in quite into depth, but um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to shout out. Um, so with that in mind, uh, maybe Carmen, do you want to kick it off? Sure, yeah. So um, yeah, this segment is all about how to create a safer space policy. I guess this is the, the bit that you will, um, uh, will hopefully use to be the basis for, um, for your own safer spaces policies. So uh, Zav, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. So um, we say safer spaces rather than safe space because um, uh, as, as uh, crass as this sounds, there's no such thing as a completely safe space. So I've used three um, examples of very common phobias that are almost unavoidable depending on where you work. So uh, triskaidekaphobia, which is a fear of number 13. Um, I sit on a board of trustees um, in London where there are 13 of us and there are always 13 of us and that is part of, it's enshrined in our constitution, which might be a problem to anyone who's a bit superstitious. Um, there's a fear of, thank you, there's a fear, um, arachnophobia, fear of spiders. Um, we work in a very old building in Brighton. There are spiders, they exist. Uh, there's not much I can do to control that. Um, and pogonophobia, sorry, Matt, <laughs> but some people do have a fear of beards. So there's all sorts of variables that can come in that act actually beyond the control of any you know, human being. Um, we've had examples of work that we've done, say with Gloop, um, one of the artists that we've worked with on New Queers, um, who as part of their show um, used a piece of gammon, a cooked piece of gammon, and then attacked it with a very large knife. Um, and whilst this was entertaining and it made a very um, strong point for their creative output, also some people might have found that quite disturbing. So it's just really important to keep in mind that there isn't really such a thing as a completely safe space. All we can do is um, aim to make our spaces safer um, within reason. So yeah, that's uh, that's that wordy slide. Um, next slide, Dav. I feel like I have a glamorous assistant. This is great. <laughs> so, um, so the purpose of a safer spaces policy, um, I'll just read these out just in case um, not all of you can see on your screens. So broadly, they're to create a relaxed and enjoyable working environment um, to get the best out of our team, 
And I use the word hour there because I really do want us to take, like, for everyone in a team to take ownership of each policy that we have, um, to take responsibility for safety, to provide clear lines of accountability. When something goes wrong, how do we escalate it? Um, and to keep it relevant to the people who sign it. And there's quite a good example that we'll talk about in our case studies later about how to make sure that it stayed relevant. So yes, next slide, Dan. thank you. Um, what makes a safer space? Um, I've added three very general bullet points that presumably all of us aspire to. Um, we all like to have respectful, understanding and kind working spaces. And the whole point of a safer spaces policy is actually being able to demonstrate why we value these. They don't have to be these three things, but why we value them. So it's useful to think about the organization and what your personal values are within that organization when writing a safer spaces policy, because that will really help to shape it and also help to keep it relevant. Um, next slide. Can I just say something about this actually as well? Yeah. The, I think it's really important to remember one thing, which is if you are running a space or a company, or if you are uh, employing people, inviting people into a space that is um, uh, put on by you, it's your responsibility to make sure that everyone that enters that space feels safe or safer. So it's, it's always good to have that in mind, as, in, it's a, it, as well as it being a collective responsibility, uh, for everyone to feel respected and understood and 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 recipient of kindness in the in the space is also your responsibility as a as a director or as a runner of the space to ensure that that happens. Yeah, that's a really good point, Zav. And also thinking about what you need in order to be kind to yourself and in order to create a space that is as safe as possible for you too, because that often gets overlooked, particularly for managers and directors who will put everyone else's needs before theirs. Actually, you can, it is possible to write a safer spaces policy that takes into account your own feelings of security and safety and respect at work. Um, so it's important to balance all of that um, and also to be mindful of, um, of where things might clash and how you will move through those clashes. Um, and yeah, therapy is one way of doing that in your own time. But, but you know, outside of that, it's um, a safer spaces policy can be a really good baseline for identifying all of those little, um, those little bitty bits. Yeah. Um, next slide. Thank you. Yeah, next slide. Uh, writing a good policy. Oh, sorry, oh. trigger. <laughs> okay, so uh, to write a good policy, this is just for any policy. Um, the language should be concise and specific. There needs to be clear lines of accountability, including contact details. It needs to be a live document, as in open to feedback and learning. And often this just gets left to like one to two years. When you see a lot of organizational policies, they often have a front sheet that says date for next review. And that to me indicates that this is not a document that people actually care about. This is one that people use for, um, for governance purposes rather than something that is meaningful. So it's useful just to bear that in mind. Um, and a policy should have contextual information in it. Who is it for? Where is it going to be used? What is the actual purpose of this? Um, and it's useful just to think about that when you're writing a policy. Otherwise, it just becomes like a meaningless checkbox exercise. And I'd really like to move away from that kind of culture of just having things in place because we should. Um, I, you know, it is my goal and it was my goal in public health to make sure that all the policies are actually useful. Um, yeah, otherwise you just end up they just end up gathering dust in the corner and collecting spiders, which is not safe. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's also within this, the contextual information is also about like, think about who, like if you think about who's it for, think about who's involving. So um, it's good on a company level to have sort of a general, um, a general policy written with everyone else, everyone that is part of the company in mind. And as Carmen said it very well, have it as a live document that keeps that can keep being adapted as new people come in but for instance if, when you are when you are on tour or on a slightly site-specific project or a, a project is outside of your usual spaces it's important to think about who you bring bringing along with and having conversations with people about what their requirements are mm. there's a difference between space like a safer space policy that is based on a touring model or, or is part of a touring model or is uh, site specific should also bear in mind 
people's ability to access the space um, because that would impact their also their presence in the space, if that makes sense. But we'll mm. go into that a little bit later. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, um, and that's also where concise and specific language comes in. It's fine to use templates, and I've included templates, um, you know, that people can go and look into afterwards, and we will make these slides available to everyone. Um, but using templates is fine, as long as you make sure that it is, that the template is useful for what you're actually doing. Um, yeah. It's it's um, it's helpful if you're going to take a template from, say, Marlborough Productions, make sure that actually it is relevant to whatever it, project that you're working on at the time. Um, so, yes, thank you. Uh, next slide. Um, incorporating by So, um, yeah, uh, a lot of organisations will have some kind of lofty mission, vision, values statement, which will broadly outline what the goals of the organization are. So they could be that you are a creative organization or that you value diversity or that you are accessible or you know whatever it is that your organization really values, those should also be reflected in a safer spaces policy. And that's a chance for you to really demonstrate with a safer spaces policy, how you will meet those um, existing values. So, um, yeah, we'll come to an example for Marlborough Productions actually um, uh, shortly, but um, making sure that those values are, are definitely centred within each policy and the safer spaces is as good as any to, to do that in. Cool. Next slide. Yeah, next. Um, so, yes. Um, so just to recap then, who are you writing the Safer Spaces policy for? It should be about yourself and it should be about the rest of the team and anyone who is going to, um, who is going to be affected by it. Um, consider accessibility requirements and the demographics of that. Um, consider its relevance. Is it realistic and achievable? Um, so uh, is this something that is possible for your venue to do? Um, we had an issue at Marlborough Productions in our previous venue where we really worked hard to be as accessible as possible. However, our theatre was up a very rickety set of stairs. Therefore, uh, we couldn't make a safe and accessible space because it just wasn't physically possible in that venue. So it's important to bear that in mind as well. That's just one example of where um, it is sometimes impossible to create something that is truly safe. Um, every time I saw people leaving the theatre, my heart was in my mouth if anyone was running <laughs> down those steps just thinking like anyone could get hurt. So that's just something to bear in mind. Um, and then it also should include members of the public um, and how you as a team can demonstrate safety towards other members of the public as well. Um, and uh, when I said earlier about using specific wording, that's to really mitigate it being open to interpretation. Um, you don't want two people to have different definitions of, of a particular word, which I see all the time, and it can cause a lot of conflict if two people have signed the same document, but they have very different understandings of it. So um, that's where it's useful to be specific in your language for the policy. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, next. Thank you. Examples. We're storming ahead. <laughs> we are actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, these three bullet points here, safeguarding, code of conduct and safer spaces. So I've just, um, the basic difference between these three policies is that safeguarding is for formal procedures of escalation. So safeguarding is always for vulnerable adults and children. Um, and there will be lines of accountability that might include um, parents and guardians, it might include social services, it might include the police, um, it really varies, but your safeguarding policy will have all of that information in it. Your code of conduct is about professional behaviour expectations. So, um, and I, I see code of conduct and safer spaces can often be merged, and personally I think that's fine, you don't want to have to sign 25 policies whenever you start a new role or a new project, um, but yeah, how I understand the difference between the two is that code of conduct is professional behaviour expectations that all staff are expected to adhere by and a safer spaces policies really covers more of the company culture than a code of conduct. Um, so at, the, at Marlborough Productions 
we pride ourselves on being creative and being open and honest um, and that is hopefully reflected in the way that we communicate um, in our social media and in our policies and in all of the written documentation that we put out and um, so I hope that is that clear is that does that make sense the difference between those three um, I think I see might be good. I can't see the chat function because I'm sharing, but it, um, um, anyone's got any questions, please do unmute and say something. But it might be good for us to kind of have a look at um, uh, examples of one of, uh, of these three, for instance. Um, so like, for instance, safeguarding, um, what, what I know that you, for instance, you and, you and David, and Tarek worked on one safeguarding policy for marble productions. Yeah, yeah, we just got ours approved in our last board meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's really wordy. It's like it's like nine pages long. <laughs> and, yeah. and the safeguarding is one of those policies that doesn't get checked often because it is a um, it's a governance, like a legal compliance policy that we need to have in place because of the nature of the work that we do. Um, <clears throat> your safeguarding policy will also be really specific so for us it's very specific to Brighton and Hove um, so we'll have um, we'll have specific links to local services in Brighton um, that uh, that we need to, so we so if for example um, there is a vulnerable adult that we work with who has um, an issue that needs to be escalated whilst they are working with us our safer sorry our safeguarding policy has a list of resources in it for local services that we would go for. Uh, there's a question, do we acknowledge any limitations our organisations may have in the safer spaces in policies, e.g. venue access challenges? Um, thanks, Sarah, that's a really good question. And yes, absolutely. Um, as, as I said earlier, it's impossible to create a space that is truly safe. So um, in order to mitigate risks, um, it's useful just to say what your limitations are and then people can make decisions about how to work around that. Um, and that actually goes for any policy. That doesn't just apply to safer spaces, that applies to all policies, because otherwise people will have an unfair expectation of what you're able to provide whenever you put an event on. And uh, we do a lot of work with uh, people who are disabled and with uh, just lots of different types of people where it is impossible for us to guarantee um, the same quality when we go on tour, perhaps, as we do uh, when we're um, putting on an event at home. So being really, really clear about those limitations. And if you're, if a limitation is brought to you to not be defensive about it and to be willing to update your policies in order to reflect that, which I think is a step that is often missed because it's admin that no one wants to think about. But I think it's really important um, I mean, it is really important because that's how you don't get sued. If you fall foul of something, um, yeah, staying reactive. Um, it's, I mean, it's useful if we can be proactive at all times, but that's just not possible. You know, you've got, I don't know about you, I have three jobs right now. It's, it's impossible to be proactive as much as I would like. So it's really important to be open-minded. And that is part of the culture that you've created with your Safer Spaces policy in the first place is that, you're kind to yourself as well as to everyone else that you work with. Yeah, I agree. It's also about like clear communication with everyone so people know what to expect and how to navigate mm. the space and the relationships between everyone that is involved in that project. Yeah. Like, I remember, for instance, with um, this ended up not happening, luckily, but we were talking at first with, um, with a group, the first group of uh, touring artists with new queers where one of the considerations was people's safety when they were traveling around the country. And um, uh, people were sometimes in different locations, some people were arriving at different times. And we were like, right, do we have money to get everyone safe into the locations properly individually? And it was like, this is actually quite hefty on the budget at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, and we just didn't. So we just opened lines of communication of how to navigate that better. So it we ended up having uh, part of uh, artists who would partner up so they wouldn't come in they wouldn't travel on their own or you know members of staff or local members of um, audiences that we have been working with or uh, members of other the venues would kind of help kind of 
people navigate the local the locations in a safer in a safer way. Um, so it's about that. It's about like, kind of like being honest with yourself and your and your team about what what essentially can be provided and what you don't have the budget or the materials or the capacity to do more. You kind of buddy up and work together to make it safer. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah. And also, um, it, it creates a bit of a virtuous circle because um, you're then creating an environment where everyone is supporting each other, which also bolsters your existing safer spaces policy. Um, it isn't always about throwing money at a problem. And there's um, I, can't, I don't have a, a whiteboard to draw, but there's a thing that we have in project management where you have um, time, money and effort and you can pick two of them. And if you don't have money, then you can put in the time and the effort, and that makes all the difference. Um, and that's also, if you put the effort into writing a robust safer spaces policy at the beginning, then it saves you money in the longer run because you can then try and mitigate stuff like this because you already have an understanding of, of where there are pinch points and you can plan around them. Um, yeah. And also then your artists get to make a nice friend in a new location, like how cool is that as, you know, as, as a performer myself, it is important that wherever I go, I know that I'm going like, to be able to sit and have a glass of wine with someone. That's very useful for me to know. Um, cup of tea. Um, but yeah, so, um, and then, yeah, we'll talk about the code of conduct in a moment because there's a really nice example um, from the Marlborough pub toilets coming up um, that, that where it, we combined um, a code of conduct with safer spaces and we had it in a very nice graphic. So Zab, do you want to go to the next slide? There you go. So I don't know if you can see this, I'll just, I'll read it out because it's not very long. Um, so this is um, the Marley's Code of Conduct back when we used to run a pub as well as a theatre. Um, it's a guide to playing nice with others and it's got a very nice graphic of a rainbow behind it. Um, the Marlborough aims to be an inclusive community driven space, but community means taking responsibility for our actions and behaviour towards one another. Safer space. If anyone makes you feel unsafe, let the bar staff know and we will do everything in our power to handle the situation. Keep your hands to yourself. Unless specifically invited, don't go invading other people's personal space. Pronouns. Don't assume, ask and respect the pronouns given, but that's not an excuse to ask invasive questions. Home from home. Please make yourself comfy, but don't trash the place. Consent is everything. No means no. Gender neutral lose. We don't care which bathroom you do your business in, so go with what works for you. But please show others the same respect you'd hope for. Mind your P's and Q's. We're not your mum, but manners are nice, aren't they? What are words worth? Almost all of us like a compliment now and then, but just be mindful if your compliments are welcome or if you're just making someone feel uncomfortable, read the signs. Look after one another, Blech. look after one another, self-explanatory. And yes, your bartender would love a drink. So I really like this. This is one of those things that um, is such a wonderful example of where they've captured, this is before I started, this was written, um, where they've captured the, the vibe of the organization, the playful nature of the organization. It's a creative approach. And they've also stated really clearly how they will treat others and how they expect all of their customers to be treated. Um, and yeah, this is such a lovely example. Um, and kind of demonstrates that a safer spaces policy doesn't need to be this heavy handed, like horrible thing that you have to run past your board and it goes through 18 layers of approval. You know, this is something that maybe it did go through 18 layers of approval. I didn't write this, but you can see how straightforward it is and how easy to read it is um, and how just putting it up, you know, in the toilets meant that people are able to adhere to it um, in a really straightforward way. While you're doing your business, you can also learn a little bit about consent. How great is that? <laughs> so yeah, that's, uh, I think that's the end of my bit on this, uh, on this section. Cool. So we'll come back to this kind of code of conduct in a bit because we adapted it to, to the tour setting. Um, and there was also, um, I think, I, Carmen, can you upload this onto that drive? Um, what, this image? Yeah, because uh, yeah, uh, yeah. it's easy to compare with the other one that's there already for the tour. Um, so um, we also, so uh, alongside all the stuff that Carmen was kind of exploring from a venue and uh, company based um, frame, I suppose, uh, we kind of 
also uh, devised a set of uh, safer space policies and, um, and codes of conduct that were more contextualized to a tour setting. Um, and for that, we, we kind of looked at a holistic approach to how to do it, because it was very important to us at the time and continues to be, of course, that when we take artists on tour, and these were the, for the Nuke was in the Block tour, um, and eventually what Nuke was in the Block became, um, we really were very hyper aware that there was a, a big lack of LGBTQ plus uh, representation um, and an intersectional representations in these, in these venues, at least. Um, and we really needed to understand how these venues operated, how our artists operated and what everyone's uh, needs were, but also the audiences. And basically um, we, there was things like, we had to look at what the context of where we were. So for instance, if places in like Blackpool, for instance, um, it, it is quite, um, it's not the safest of space of, of places or regions for people to uh, navigate very safely without any street harassment, for instance, or there is very little, conversation about queerness, for instance, and everyone in the project kind of defines define themselves as queer or under that umbrella. But in that location, the conversation around the word queer was still quite, um, there's still quite a lot of uh, derogative connotations to that. So for instance, so we needed to understand where we were operating in and how, and how best to contextualize the work that we're doing and people's safety so that the work and everyone could be as proficient as possible or as efficient as possible. Um, so with that, we had we literally had conversations with every single venue, every single artist that we employed, every single crew member that was coming on tour with us to understand what their requirements were and also people locally. So for instance, in places like uh, Bradford, uh, the wonderful Bradford and Theatre in the Mill, uh, we contacted, we, we got in touch with Sonia Sandu, who's a local uh, producer and amazing um, person of role, really. And uh, she kind of helped us understand a little bit better of the scene. Um, and also as a queer person, she kind of had inside knowledge in that. Um, and so they allow us to kind of navigate it in a better way. Um, and we created kind of different uh, 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 spaces and po uh, policies, I suppose, and code of and, and code of conduct. So the code of conduct on tour slightly different from the code of conduct in on venue because it suggested uh, the travel uh, times as well as the spaces that they were going to be in, as well as the accommodation places that they were going to be in, um, that everyone was going to be in, and how to navigate the travel between all of them. Um, and the code of conduct specifically, I think it was uh, very important for us that everyone had direct access to it um, so they were all of them were sent it together with their artist agreements and contracts and uh, we were able to revise them and as common will go in a bit later on um, depending on what people felt like it wasn't appropriate for them or they wanted something to change in terms of the care also in the code of conduct it was very important for us to make sure that people some of these artists had never been on tour um, and had never been outside of the region uh, in terms of working uh, they had never been working outside of the regions that they often operate in and um, and they're also the first time that some of them had worked with us outside of our venue so it was very important for us to feel to so th to that they would feel comfortable with where they were um, and I think I am kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit on the slide scheme here, but just to kind of give you an example that um, alongside the code of conduct, what we did was create a care packs and we also include care packs um, in the drive folder at the end of this, but um, so you can download it for free if you want to. Um, we'll go through them in a little bit longer, but care packs basically included all the information that all the stuff that we we're going to do to the venues and to the artists to make sure that everything was um, safer, I suppose. Um, so yeah, we're going through the new question of block case study. Um, so as I was saying earlier, uh, the uh, this was, it was supposed to be a touring uh, a touring network only uh, originally, but what we then did find was that 
by framing the project as a primarily an LGBTQ plus project of touring across the country with care and access at the forefront of our thoughts in terms of artist programming, but also in terms of access for both the artists and the venues, it allowed us to rethink the model completely as we went along on tour. And so it, it eventually it turned into an artist and community development project. And with that mind frame, we were able to understand how best to create safer networks and safer spaces for everyone, the local LGBTQ plus communities and the artists themselves. I think, oh, sorry, trigger happy again. Um, uh, for this, it was really important, as I was saying earlier, to think about it as in, in a holistic mindset. Um, because they allow us to create uh, to create the to understand actually better the the ways that people operate in and how we everyone can collectively come together in a safer space so as i was saying the new quiz on the block team had some had uh, it was amazing obviously and really high quality work um but um but we also had some challenges uh, to it uh, we were traveling uh, I think the I'm going to use the first story as an example because the last the, the next two years were more um, uh, contextualized and differently. But basically, we were traveling band for the first year, um, where we visited these towns for the first time, and uh, the tra this traveling band included people who were from marginalized communities, um, including. Uh, queer and disabled um, artists, uh, artists of color, for instance, as well, where traveling around the country isn't particularly the most safest of options. Um, and we also understood that there was a serious lack of LGBTQ plus representation in each, in each venue um, that had very little com communication and relationships with local queer communities. So, uh, and also the new Quiz in the Block was a, a, this kind of huge endeavor, the biggest one we've ever done as a company with the Marvel Productions, where we were literally coordinating multiple locations and multiple teams across the country um, throughout the year, whilst developing new work and, and creating access points with audiences. And the venues that we, operating, we were operating under and in uh, didn't have well. They had some. Some of them had uh, safety requ uh, safety requirements and access require uh, access um, provisions, um, but there were some of them that were really seriously lacking. So, for instance, one of them was um, uh, there was most of our crew and artists were queer. Um, some of them were uh, gender non-binary, for instance, and uh, there was also we were hyper aware that there was also a huge. Uh, conversation on mainstream across the country about um, about access to to uh, uh, public bathrooms for trans and non gender uh, gender non-binary uh, people. So we wanted to make sure that those things weren't an issue in the spaces that we visited. So we had deep, strong conversations with each venue about changing the spaces into um, uh, non-gendered or at least less gendered policing spaces. So we changed the bathroom um, allocations to non-gender specific uh, bathroom spaces with also one available for people who were very, who felt safer in spaces that were gendered. Um, but uh, this was always in coordination with each venue and on a case by case specific and in collaboration with the artists that we were operating with as well. Um, so we changed those. Uh, we made sure that language around the project was in, was used as in an inclusive way. That the staff that were um, in the front of house bar and ticket services were also adapting their language when they operate when they uh, engage with people. That there were safety measures in terms of racial profiling put in place as well. Um, there was uh, travel and safety requirements uh, specific. So in terms of that, like examples would be uh, some artists didn't feel particularly confident on walking from the train station in Blackpool to the venue, which was about half an hour walk, um, I don't know, a bit less, but it was like the first time that we went to that, to that town, we had a lot of uh, street harassment, for instance. So we wanted to make sure that people who were visiting the town for the first time didn't encounter it and felt safe. So things that we did was we provisioned the we provisioned we provisioned, sorry, provisioned uh, taxis uh, picking people up or members of the team that were already present in the town to go and pick them up so that there was a safety a safer way of them navigating the town. 
We also made sure that the hotels that were being booked or the Airbnbs that were being booked um, were of the highest quality and all of them met the access requirements needed for each uh, artist. And each artist, we created a care pack um, that was two care packs actually, which I can show you a little bit um, of this. Just gonna do, sorry, I went, I went on it in a, in a really weird way. I didn't mean that, sorry. <clears throat> yeah, so we had two types of care packs. Uh, one of them was a sort of a more general one that we, and this is included in the drive uh, folder that we'll give later on. And this is information that we send to the venues, kind of preparing them about what direct actions we're going to do. Um, and this included things like, just to give you some examples, like ensure each presenting venue and festival has an accurate picture of the access needs of participating artists, special, special consideration, um, will be given to the context of the performances. This information will be explained at the front of house and box office teams, so as to ensure safety within the theater space, provide induction and training sessions to all tour venues and how to work with LGBTQ plus artists, how to avoid tokenism, gender and racial profiling, coordinating participating artist technical needs, offering a clear point of contact for any technical issues that may arise. Ensure the copy, the copy marketing materials, uh, reflect any particular information the artist might want to include as a warning. So this is kind of a, both for, for us, for the venues, for the artists and the audiences all, all together. And we'll organize transportation uh, between venues and wherever possible, uh, clear point of contact with Marlborough Theatre team, um, create a venue specific risk assessment for each state and, um, and ensure that contact information on local law enforcement and the medical services are at hand, as Carmen was saying earlier as well. We also apply that for the tour. Um, arrange a clear welcome and introduction to the pre presenting venue festival at the start of engagement. And this is something that not all, always is not always done, but I think it's really important to kind of home in. If you're touring or if you're presenting a show in, this, in a space that you don't often operate under or you're rehearsing in a space that you don't often operate under, it's always nice to have people locally or the person who runs the venue or people who run the venue to welcome you in because it will, it will allow you to feel a, a bit more at home and it will allow you to feel like there's a broader connection rather than just coming in for one day and fucking off for the rest of the year. Um, and it creates a stronger bond between you and the people that you're working with. Yeah, I just want to jump in as well. Um, like this is a, it sounds like a huge long list of all of the many things that the thousands of things that you need to consider. But actually, if your underpinning aligns with your like just general organizational values, actually a lot of this stuff is quite straightforward. Um, it's just making sure that at every point of your project timeline, you're thinking about how does how do I bring in like safety and accessibility into this bit of the project. So um, I only came on board in the final year of New Queers so far. Um, and part of how I was um, enacting this was to just call people, just phone them up. Once I've sent an email booking hotel rooms, just call the hotel and say, um, I, I need to be really clear with you about how to use pronouns. So quite a lot of this, like the admin, also involved just sending the hotel staff articles that they might never have read before about how to how to use different pronouns because they'd never had you know they'd never had to consider it before and that was something that um they really appreciate the hotels really appreciated because it made them up their game a bit for other customers as well so it, it really if you have safety and accessibility as an underpinning for all of your projects and that is enshrined in your safer spaces policy actually all of these micro steps end up feeling quite natural um because you're just taking like you know each of your milestones and thinking how do we make sure that this is safe and accessible for all of the artists and producers and people that we work with yeah i agree i think it's also very important for everyone to be everyone that's operating in that space to be knowledgeable of the procedures that are in place uh, and that is to do with the safer spaces as well that we're creating but also if something happens how do they engage with with these procedures who do they contact? Uh, how do they raise the alarm that something's happening? You know what I mean? Or how do they raise an issue? That's very important. That's very clearly defined and that people know exactly who to contact or how to proceed. Um, 
I think it's also very important to regular check-ins. We used to do a, a check-in and out, uh, not every day, but a check-in on the point of arrival on tour when we arrive at the, at the, at the location, um, at the region, sorry, and uh, another check-in before the show goes on um, and a check-out. Either at the end of the show, we all go for dinner together or have a drink together um, or get pissed together. Um, and uh, or the next day uh, before everyone moves on to the next location or goes home, we'll have a check out just to ensure that everyone's okay, happy that any issues are raised. I love having breakfast with artists. I think yeah. that's really nice. That's such a nice way to connect with people. Like if you get a hotel that has you know, that has breakfast included, it's such a nice way to reserve a large table and all sit together. And I think the artists enjoy that as well because otherwise they can feel quite isolated. But if they're with the rest of the team, I don't know, there's something really delightful about having breakfast with a whole bunch of creatives that's, you know, that we don't get to do very often. So, yeah, um, it doesn't all have to be work. It can be a bit of a holiday. Too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then, so just want to very quickly, because I'm aware of timing, actually, um, we just want to kind of run through a, a thing, which I can't share with this with you, unfortunately, because it includes private information, but just want to give an overall view of uh, a care pack, um, package that we kind of created, which this is this was sent to every single partner, including local um, sponsors or local uh, supporters and the venue partners themselves. And this is both a combination between uh, uh, care pack and care needs for each, for each artist specifically, as well as language used around their work and language used uh, when referring to them, for instance. Uh, and this was so that the venues themselves had the information at hand before we, arri we arrived, what to expect, um, but also that the marketing teams could also adapt their language um, without us having to, you know, um, constantly being policing people's language. And it involves some care notes about, you know, how to communicate with them and things like that. I don't want to go into too much of this because this is private information, but it's something, there's something about kind of creating clear lines of communication. And that includes all of that information as well uh, that the venue should have in, at hand. Um, I think maybe maybe I can create like a version of this that leaves anonymity. Yeah, maybe I could do that. Um, and then I'll put it on the drive later on. Um, so swiftly moving on because I'm just hyper aware of timing. Um, the, uh, yeah, maybe we'll go into uh, the, the, the suggested um, uh, case studies. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So um, if we go to slide twenty, um, the artist A. I've just anonymized it just because I haven't checked permissions with the artist. <laughs> um, so um, with artist A that we worked with, um, we had a template that was already written for our safer spaces. Is it safer spaces or code of conduct? I think it was safer spaces. Um, we just had a general template that seemed fit for purpose. We've been using it for a couple of years. No one had any issues with it. Um, they had taken a little while to sign it and it was part of my role as the general manager to get signatures from everyone um, across, you know, all those bits of paperwork and, you know, all of that stuff. Um, and they, for some reason, they'd taken a while to sign it. So I had a chat with them and it turned out there was a line in it that they felt really uncomfortable about. And it was just something that had been put in with good intentions. And the line was something like, um, if you are a victim of something, you do not have to feel something else. And um, they weren't comfortable signing, putting, you know, putting their name and signature on something that instructed them about how they should or shouldn't feel, which is something that obviously hadn't been considered before. And when I reviewed the policy, it didn't, you know, stick out as anything particularly concerning. But actually, as soon as they pointed it out, it made a huge amount of sense. I wouldn't feel comfortable with someone telling me how I should feel after something bad had happened to me. Um, and it was really easy to change it. It took me like three minutes um, just to double check the wording with a colleague um, to then change it. And then that was something that artist A was then happy to sign. And then also just going around to the other artists just to check, hey, we know you've signed this already. We've changed some wording. If you're happy sticking with the original wording, that's fine. If you want to sign this updated copy, here it is. And actually none of the artists were that bothered, um, probably because it's just more admin for them. But actually, I I really do stand by that change, um, and it it kept the it kept our safer spaces policy relevant and up to date because, you know, 
it's no skin off my nose. It takes me three minutes to make a positive difference. And, you know, if all of us do that, like 1% of positive change often enough, then it creates 100% of positive change um, 100 times down the line. So um, I think that's how percentages work. So yeah, that was a, a specific example of where it needed to be changed and how easy it was and how it does, you know, it's now our new template. And I'm, I, I think that's, I'm pretty sure that's in the shared resources. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it is. Mm. Um, and then we'll just go very quickly to artist B, which uh, I think I can say this because it's Gloop and Gloop is very straightforward and out, out, outward facing with their, um, with their access um, requirements. So in terms of a Gloop, uh, oozing Gloop uh, is a, a neurodiverse artist who was one of the main commissions that we did with a new quiz in the block. And it was the main commission that was going to come on tour to every single venue with us. Um, and so we, we kind of worked from the ground up, actually, and we adapted a lot of the ways that we worked with artists for Gloop specifically because they have um, well, they, they have a very, very particular ways of kind of working and also quite loose. So in a way, it's kind of like you have to adapt your way into becoming more adjustable to change as it goes along with, with Gloop. Um, so it's about kind of setting up a series of communication channels that you can and this, that you can between us and the producer for Gloop and the um, the BSL interpreters from Gloop and the local venues where everyone kind of knew what to expect. So if Gloop was two hours late for a rehearsal, we knew that it was fine because Catherine, who was the producer, was on top of it. But we also knew that uh, Gloop was probably uh, stuck somewhere um, and eventually they will arrive and eventually they will do the, the work that needed to be done. So things like that. And uh, we kind of also shared responsibilities. So between me and, Car and oh gosh, Catherine and uh, the venue partners and David, we kind of all kind of uh, help, kind of did a bit of teamwork and producing and, and making sure that and um, making sure that Gloop was um, comfortable and had all the access requirements wherever they went to. Um, but that was a very specific kind of case that it was we hadn't we hadn't kind of adapted our ways of working to that yet before um, <clears throat> and they also had a they had a very specific kind of way of communicating so we adapted also the way they kind of framed copy so that people knew what to expect when they were coming to the show we kind of uh, adapted um, front of house policies so that people were able to come in and out of the show we put signs around kind of alerting people about what to expect from the show and things like that and these were all kind of worked with in collaboration with Gloop themselves um and I think that's it yeah I mean I just wanted to add to Gloop that that is also a really good uh, Gloop's particularly um brilliant to work with because it also um the team had to be briefed on the best ways of working with Gloop as well as um, Gloop understanding how the team works. So having that, um, yeah, having that balance was really useful. Um, yeah, I loved working with Gloop. Um, uh, yeah, there's, that's, um, yeah, it was a really useful way to find out lots of things about accessibility in, in, in one artist. Um, and it was really helpful. Um, and yeah, I actually think if you make something accessible um, in one area, it actually has a knock-on effect on making it accessible in others as well which is quite a nice group. So, yeah. um, so we're coming to the end, um, but we just want to give you a little, before we go into, into maybe we'll do a five minute break because we're running late. Um, is that better? Is that okay? Is that okay, Carmen? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, is that, is, that's okay with everyone um, and Matt, obviously, because we're going to have a 15 minute one, but because we're running late, it might be best to just do a shorter one. Oh, um, Lena needs 15 minutes. Okay, cool. Let, let's do 15 minutes then. Um, and, but maybe we'll, before we go into a break, uh, Carmen, do you want to go into the extender links bit? Just want to say what, what they are. Yeah, so I've just in the, um, can you go to the next slide, Zav? So I've included some external links of specific examples from, they're all woke lefty do-gooders, um, but just specific examples of 
safer spaces and how they've been tailored to the needs of each one. So Sisters Uncut, Stop the Arms Fair, Occupy London and radicallibrarianship.org. Um, but uh, you can see how they've each really thought about what it is that their organisation is trying to do and how their safer spaces policy reinforces that, um, reinforces those values. Um, so they're all, I, I really liked all of those examples. Um, and they're also written in quite useful language that everyone can understand. Um, and yeah, that's the external links that I've included, as well as our own ones. I think it's useful to get as many examples as possible to see which fits you best. Um, I need to stop share and then share the, um, the folder with all the resources uh, onto the chat box here. So I'll do that now. But before we do that, maybe we'll go on the break. So we'll see each other here at 12 at 15 past. That's okay. Matt, you're muted. Hi, if, again. Um, if people want to leave, they're welcome to come back in 15 minutes. Um, and I'll just let you back in. Also, if you want to stay on the chat and talk to each other, if you want to stick around, you're welcome to. Um, but if not, we'll see you in 15 minutes. Thank you.